All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having an incredible week. Got a fun show for you guys this morning. We're going to number five and number four of our contender rankings. Happens to be two teams that had a showdown last night. An absolute and complete ass-kicking by the Los Angeles Clippers of the Phoenix Suns. For those of you guys interested in that specific game, we are going to be doing a full film breakdown. I have 17 clips from the 35-4 to run from the Clippers to start that game. We're going to break it all down, but because of the podcast audience, we're trying to order this in a way to where audio stuff is at the front and don't worry, we'll end up running it as a breakout clip anyway, but we're going to lead with our contender rankings five and then four. And then the tail end of the show, we're going to be doing a deep dive in the film of the Clippers ass kicking of the Suns from last night. You guys know the drill before we get started, subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel. So you don't miss any more of our videos. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you your podcast under Hoops Tonight. It's also super helpful if you leave a rating and a review on that front. Don't forget about my Twitter feed at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss any show announcements or film threads that I do from time to time. Last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in the YouTube comments. We are going to be doing a mailbag during tomorrow's show. And on that note, let's talk some basketball. So number five, I have the Phoenix Suns. I have the Clippers, the Mavs, and the Suns kind of all in the same kind of grouping. And it's funky because I think the Suns are the worst team of that group. But I also think they have the best matchup advantages to potentially beat Denver. So once again, like I said at the beginning of this contender list, I kind of view three through nine as all kind of bunched up to begin with. And most of it's going to come down to who plays who. For instance, I think the Clippers are a better basketball team than the Suns, but they have the most likely the Dallas Mavericks in the first round. And then if Denver beats Minnesota tonight, they're going to have to turn around and play Denver right after that. So it might be one of those things where the Suns just get better matchups if they get out of this mess and maybe they end up making it farther anyway. So when it comes to this group of teams, this three through nine on my list, it really just has to do with who they end up playing to begin with. So keep that in mind. But obviously got the Suns at number five. They're 46 and 33 right now. Currently the seventh seed in the Western Conference. They are 10th in offensive rating for the season, um, 13th in defensive rating for the season, 20th in defensive rebounding, although they are a good offensive rebounding team. They're 10th in offensive rebounding. A big part of that is they're just so good at getting defenses into rotation. And like I talk about a lot on the show, get the defense into rotation. Your rebounding matchups aren't as solid. You're kind of chasing people around. You don't have a clear box out in front of you, and so you can give up a lot of offensive rebounds in those situations. Their strengths. Again, like we are going to do with this team, uh, exactly what we did with the other teams in this list. Strengths, weaknesses, and then what their playoff path looks like. So they have the best drive and kick game in the league, in my opinion. When they play advantage basketball, which is not every night, they're a little bit... I We're going to talk about this in a little bit. The Suns are, in my opinion, like the most inconsistent team of all these good teams on this list. Their ceiling and floor are pretty far apart. It's a big part of why they've been had so many questionable losses this year. For example, they have 10 losses this year against teams that are below 500. That's more than anybody in the top 10 in the Western Conference. As a matter of fact, it's uh, to give you some perspective, the Utah Jazz have 11 losses to teams that are below 500. So we've seen a lot of good and bad basketball from the Suns, which kind of poisons the data and what makes it complicated because we're thinking about them in terms of their ceiling, but we know that they're capable of nights like last night as well. But when they play advantage basketball, and what I mean by that is the stars actually taking it seriously just to get the defense in rotation rather than tough shot making and play advantage basketball basketball off of that, they can be very good. I look at offense as a three-step process. One, advantage creation. That means drawing multiple defenders to the ball and creating a closeout opportunity somewhere on the floor. Step two, advantage extending. That's taking that closeout opportunity and driving it to generate an even better closeout opportunity or an opportunity to finish the play. That third step, play finishing. That's your vertical spacer under the rim who's either dunking a lob or dunking out of the dunker spot. That's your guy catching and knocking down a three-point shot on the weak side. That's your guy you know, against an elite defense that's doing a good job of chasing you off the line and defending the the rim, that's the guy that can, you know, pump fake and rip through and hit a one dribble pull up in a soft spot in the middle of the defense. Those are the three steps. And the Suns have really good players in all three groups. They have three guys that can consistently get the defense in rotation in Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and Kevin Durant. A fourth in Yusuf Nurkic, which we've talked about in our video film sessions. Again, we did a whole film session on the Suns' advantage creation basketball in last week's 
episode. So make sure you go back in the feed and look for that if you're looking for more visible examples. But they have a lot of guys that can get the defense in rotation, and Nur Nurkic is one of them. Switch a pick and roll, toss it down to the post against a guard. He's going to draw that second defender, and they can play off of that. Advantage extending to me, they've got a lot of guys that can – uh, take a closeout opportunity and turn it into something better. All of the stars who get tons of opportunities off the ball. Grayson Allen's great at it as well. And then play finishing. There's literally a ton of that all over the floor. Uh, all the role players that are in the rotation when they're healthy can shoot. They, they, they can really spread you out and pick you to pieces like that. Again, it's just about whether or not they're diligent enough to do it with consistency. Another strength, they have a lot of foot speed on the uh, on the perimeter. That's the strength of this group from an athletic standpoint. They've got length and speed. They're not an overly strong group. They're not an overly tall group, but they have strength and speed. And so when they're engaged defensively, they can be very good, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, they also have a plethora of star talent to squeeze something out of nothing. They've been the most efficient pull-up shooting team in the league this year. They get 1.05 points per pull-up jump shot. That is number one in the NBA. That's a great ceiling raiser. Rescue possessions. That means you know six seconds on the shot clock, your primary actions got shut down. There's not enough time to run something else. Somebody's just got to go create a bucket off the bounce. The Suns are great at that. Coverage beaters. That means like... If they are defending a pick and roll two on two and they are running a deep drop coverage and staying glued off the ball to stay out of rotation, they have guys that can set their man up on the ball screen, get them trapped on the other side, get down to a spot, you know, whether it's at the three point line or just inside the three point line, and they can get a quality jump shot. There will be, it's very possible, at least for stretches. You, D Denver, for instance, is a team that uh, that could potentially do this to them if they run into if they happen to get the seven seed uh, out of the play in tournament. And let's say Denver loses to Minnesota tonight and it ends up being Denver Phoenix. We've seen Denver show for stretches uh, that they're willing to kind of concede those types of those types of mid range pull up jump shots for KD and Devin Booker. Those are coverage beaters, and we know the Suns are capable of hitting those. We literally saw them do it against Denver at uh, points in the past. And then lastly, late-game shot making. Again, another great example from the Nuggets game. Just you do everything right all game long, but you know KD hits a big pull-up three over the top of Aaron Gordon and makes a couple more in OT, and you end up losing, right? So that's a, a strength of this roster is they've got a lot of top-end talent that can convert those, again, uh, the, the rescue possessions, coverage beaters, and late-game shot making. Also, uh, Frank Vogel is a very good defensive coach who excels at scouting and adjusting to opposing offenses. This is something I uh, uh, noticed firsthand rooting for him when he was the coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. My uh, uh, the, the fallout with Frank Vogel and the Lakers pretty much stemmed around buy-in and just like them hearing the same voice for too long and the Lakers stars particularly just tuning Frank Vogel out. That was why he had to go. I always thought that Frank Vogel was a good coach, even if he could be stubborn with some of his personnel decisions from time to time. And then lastly, Yusuf Nurkic. I know it doesn't seem like much, and uh, honestly, before the season, I'll freely admit I was one of the guys that was wrong about this deal uh, just because I thought DeAndre Ayton was a more talented basketball player. And there's a case to be made that DeAndre Ayton would be a better option in just about every situation except for this particular Denver matchup. Yusuf Nurkic just does a really nice job with his size battling Jokic off of positions and making things more difficult for them. There's also been a, a you know, even beyond the Jokic matchup, he's been really good just as a connective piece for them offensively. But uh, in this particular case, I'm leaving him in as a strength for the Denver Nuggets matchup. I think his size is a legit asset that a lot of teams in the Western Conference do not have for that specific matchup. Now, their weaknesses. We're going to talk about some specifics. But the major weakness this team has is exactly what you saw last night. They are not a very physically imposing roster. Like we talked about, they have some speed, they have some length, but they are not a strong team especially without Yusuf Nurkic. Like the, uh, last night, obviously, Nurkic did not play. But even with Nurkic, they're not a physically strong team. And when you punch them in the mouth with physicality, they can stagger a bit and they can lose their mojo. We saw something very similar from the same kind of Clippers setup last year in the first round before Kawhi Leonard got hurt. They went into that playoff series as the more talented team. The Clippers just mucked it up right away when they got into that first round series and stole a game off of them, and then obviously Kawhi gets hurt in game two. But bat like to put it simply, basketball is pretty. It's a pretty game, especially with the Suns, especially with all their offensive skill that they have. But it's pretty until it's not. 
And then it evolves into something else. It becomes about toughness and fight and motor and execution. It gets ugly. It becomes a rock fight. And the Suns are capable of playing in that type of style, but it doesn't come naturally to them. And so they can be very inconsistent in those types of games. Like I talked about earlier, one of the largest gaps in the league between their floor and their ceiling, and that concerns me if they run into a tough physical type of matchup. For instance, a... a we talked about the Denver matchup. They have succeeded in that group when they can spread them out, and obviously with the matchup of Nurkic on Jokic, but they've also struggled when Denver's been able to strangle the game, tie things down into the half court, and out-execute them. Leading into that Kevin Durant pull-up jump shot, I think it was a 12-0 run from the Nuggets in that first matchup where the Suns won in overtime. It was a 12-0 run where Denver kind of played bully ball on them, and that can be a weakness for them. A couple of specifics when it comes down to to their uh, struggles in physicality. They don't defensive rebound well. They're 20th in defensive rebound percentage. They are 27th in points in the paint scored per 100 possessions. They do not score baskets easily inside the painted area. They take the third most jump shots per possession in the league, so they are a jump shot variance type of team. They do not have a defensive strong point. This is something I was looking at today, which is concerning. 20th in three-pointers made allowed per 100 possessions. 15th in points in the paint allowed per 100 possessions, so they don't guard the three or the paint particularly well. They are not good at defensive rebounding, like we mentioned earlier, and they are not good in transition defense. So those are their weaknesses. Their pathway, got to be able to hold up and rock fight basketball and match physicality. If they do, their talent can shine through. But that's definitely, like we talked about earlier, a weakness. Got to play advantage basketball. I want to see their assist percentage in the postseason in the mid-60s instead of in the high 50s. That, to me, is a strong indicator of the style of basketball that they're playing. If they lean on just tough, tough shot making, they're going to go cold and they're going to lose. But if they play advantage basketball and they spread teams out and get great shots, they have a really good chance to go on a run. And then lastly, they need an all-time defensive run from Kevin Durant. He is the one guy on this team that has the supreme athletic gifts to really impact the game defensively regardless of matchup. It's a lot of pressure on him, but it's what they need him to do. Number four, the Los Angeles Clippers, the 51 and 28, fourth in the Western Conference, third in, def or third in offense, 15th in defense, 23rd in defensive rebounding. Their strengths, Positional strength, and by strength, I mean literally physical strength. Kawhi Leonard, big, strong forward who can really be handsy and physical and cause problems for players. Avika Zubac at the center position is very much that. Russell Westbrook, once again, you saw last night the type of wrecking ball he can be physically because of his size and strength at the guard position. And then Terrence Mann started the game on Devin Booker last night and did an incredible job with his physicality. Again, we're going to dig into the film here. I've got a film session on the Clipper Suns game that we're going to go over uh, right after this particular segment. And so um, if you haven't seen that yet, you can either check out the breakout clip or you can hang around. It'll be up here in a minute. Uh, they put their hands on you and they make everything a pain in the ass. And when they're locked in as a switching defense, they can really stagnate you and bully you. Like you get stuck on an island with the Kawhi, with the Zubach, with the Russ, with the Terrence Mann, and they're just physical, they're handsy, they keep you in front and they make you uncomfortable. And they can be really good defensively when that shines through. They're a very good three-point shooting team. They don't take a ton of them because they take so many mid-range jump shots, but they're very accurate when they do. They're the fourth highest three-point percentage in the league. They're good at forcing turnovers and running. This is like, they're not a transition push pace team. They do when Russ plays, and you saw a lot of that last night where like Russ will just get a defensive rebound and just really bring the ball up the floor with Verve and, and, and kind of get them set into the half court quickly. But um, they're, they don't really do that for the most part over the course of the large sample, especially when James Harden is on the floor. But they do get a lot of steals, and they do get a lot of transition opportunities off of those steals. So they are seventh in steals per 100 possessions and seventh in transition frequency per cleaning the glass. And they're also eighth in transition efficiency. So they get steals, they run, they get baskets out of that. A couple of examples from the Suns game last night that you guys will see here in just a couple of minutes. Paul George is getting hot at the right time. 25 points, 5 rebounds, and 4 assists per game in his last 15 games. Check this out. 52% from the field, 48% from 3, 97% from the line. That's about as preposterous efficiency as you could hope to see from a volume score like that. And then Kawhi Leonard, if he's healthy, in my opinion, he's one of the top 5 playoff players in the league. I think you're taking Jokic 1, and then it's probably Luka 2. You Luka Giannis in that mix, and then it's Kawhi. And like, you know, like you can make a case Kawhi's ahead of Luka and Giannis if you want to, but he's certainly in the top four there 
of playoff players when you get into this kind of physical environment. The reality is, is his combination of size and strength and footwork, like I talk about, footwork is the skill element of getting to spots. It makes it impossible to stop him from getting to his spots. And that translates even as the physicality increases in these playoff environments. It's a big part of what makes him one of the best playoff players in the league. He can just get to spots 10 to 15 feet away from the basket and get really easy shots pretty consistently. <clears throat> Clippers' weaknesses, not a very fast team. They do have fast players, right? Like Terrence Mann, super fast. Russell Westbrook, super fast. But their advantage is more from a personnel standpoint in strength and length. They're not a great straight-line speed type of, uh, of team. If you look at their starters, four of their starters are not overly fast. James Harden, pretty slow. Ivica Zubac, pretty slow. Kawhi Leonard, he's a power player. He's not a straight line speed player. And then Paul George at 34 years old is not the fastest guy in the world either. And he's more of a finesse over the top type of shot maker, right? He's not a guy that's just bringing overwhelming straight line speed to the table. And so we see that weakness manifest in a bunch of specific areas. First of all, they're a terrible transition defense. They have the eighth worst transition frequency allowed per cleaning the glass and the fifth worst transition efficiency allowed. They also don't put a lot of pressure on the rim in the half court. Most of their points in the paint come in runouts in transition. This is not a team that is just slashing to the basket and getting easy layups like that. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how much Russell Westbrook plays when they get in the postseason. That's something I have in my path segment is like if James Harden, who by the way is not playing well as of late, if he falls apart in the postseason and they lean into Russ, Russ could be a guy who brings some of that rim pressure to address that specific issue. But with their starting group, they don't put a lot of pressure on the rim in the half court. They also can get beat to loose balls and long rebounds uh, as a result of their lack of foot speed. So that's why they're a bad defensive rebounding team. It's why they don't force a turn of turnovers. They're 20th in turnovers forced per 100 possessions. Again, they get steals on the ball with their physicality, but they're not a passing lane type of team. They're not like the Oklahoma City Thunder jumping passing lanes and getting out. It's mostly just physical on the ball, Russ and Kawhi snatching the ball away from you, Terrence Mann snatching the ball away from you and running out the other way. They're a high steals team, but not a high turnover team like that. Teams that are typically really good at forcing turnovers are super fast, right? Like Oklahoma City is number one in turnovers forced per 100 possessions. Blazing fast team. The Orlando Magic are second in forcing turnovers. They have really fast and physical on-the-ball defenders. And then Memphis is third. So young and fast is typically what forces a turn of turnovers. The Clippers are not that type of team. They're also a little bit jump shot reliant. They're eighth in jump shot frequency, first in pull-up jump shot frequency. We've seen them go cold, namely in the 2020 season, as pull-up jump shooters. But they are a little bit susceptible to variance when it comes to that jump shooting, especially against teams that have real length that can offer contests without fouling. And then lastly, is Kawhi going to be healthy and ready to go? Uh, like, obviously, he's sitting out right now. We don't have any word. You know how it is with Kawhi's camp. Whenever he gets hurt, it's just it's just like batting up the hatches and no one tells anybody anything. And so we'll see what ends up happening. But um, obviously, Kawhi has a history of falling apart physically when he gets into the postseason. His last two playoff runs that he played, he broke down before he could get to the finish line. Now he's breaking down. He's not even there yet. So that obviously is a, a, is a potential weakness to keep in mind. Their path, very simple. Kawhi has to be healthy and play like Kawhi. Uh, Ty, uh, Ty Lue has to really manage that James Harden, Russell Westbrook dynamic. It's interesting because, like, guys, you guys know I'm not a huge Russell Westbrook fan. But, like, weirdly enough, in the postseason, his effectiveness goes up a level just because he's such a freak athlete. And in that physical environment, he can really be impactful, especially if he's on the ball because he can be a little bit tricky. And uh, we're going to show some examples, but he can be a little bit of a aggressive off-ball defender that can make some mistakes off the ball. Uh, but James Harden can fall apart in, in in my opinion, worse ways than what Russell Westbrook can fall apart doing. And so even though there will be some spacing concerns, it's going to be an interesting dynamic for Ty Lue to kind of measure where it's like, oh, this is a Russ series or this is a Russ game versus, oh, this is a James Harden series or this is a James Harden game. That's going to be the type of uh, balance he's going to have to strike. They need to shoot the ball well, obviously. And then the big thing is going to be matchups for them. they got to find a way to get through Luka and Nikola Jokic. Tonight, the Timberwolves go to Denver. If Denver wins that game, which they'll be favored, it obviously depends on if all the stars play. But let's say Denver plays their guys and they win, then it's probably going to be Clippers-Mavs in the first round. And Luka has consistently given the Clippers issues in the postseason. Even though the Clippers have escaped those series, those were limited in terms of talent. Clippers teams that pushed them to the brink consistently. And then if they happen to beat Dallas, 
Waiting for them on the other side will be the Denver Nuggets. And so matchups are going to be tough for them. It's a, it's kind of a pain in the butt for the Clippers. It's like you have this great regular season. You finish fourth in the Western Conference, and your reward is just a preposterously difficult playoff path. But, hey, that's what the Western Conference is at this point. So I have the Clippers at number four. We have three more that we're going to be hitting. Um, probably going to hit all of them tomorrow in all likelihood. Um you guys can probably guess what the order is going to be if you've listened to me this season, but that's where we're at at this point. The NBA season is in full swing, and when I can't get enough of the action on the court, I spice things up betting on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Right now, new customers bet 5 bucks and get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Right now, the championship favorite is the Boston Celtics at plus 190. You can also get the Lakers at plus 3,500. So if you're a believer in their late season run, that is a big number. Uh, North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. The crown is yours. Let's head over to the film. I've uh, titled this segment The Anatomy of an Ass Kicking. So <laughs> the Clippers got off to a 35-4 to start against the Suns. We're going to look at the specifics here on some film. All right, so first, we're going to go over the main coverage issue that Phoenix was having with the Clippers. And the main coverage issue was they were, on account of Paul George being such a good pull-up jump shooter, they were hedging and recovering on ball screens. So here we have Grayson Allen guarding Paul George. We have Zubac getting ready to set the screen. Yusuf Nurkic, or excuse me, uh, Drew Eubanks, again, what his job here is with the hedge and recover is to stop Paul George from making a drive to his left-hand side, and then recover inside. But Paul George is beating it, and Zubac is beating it just with a basic slip. So what we're going to see here, we're going to see um, we're going to see uh, uh, Zubac step out, and as he steps out, that lunge step, Paul George picks up his dribble immediately. There's not a lot of length on the ball to disrupt this pass, unfortunately, so it's a really easy over-the-top pass to Zubac slipping down the lane. He's going to slip, and that's Bradley Beal waiting for him at the rim. It's just not enough size in that case. He misses this layup, but again, he's just too big for all these guys down low, and he's able to clean it up and get another offensive rebound. <clears throat> Same exact sort of thing here. Off of the KD missed free throw, he was doomed from the start. He missed two first two free throws. Just a weird game for the Suns. But here we go. Same exact sort of thing. We got uh, KD on the ball this time, so more length on the ball. Eubanks is guarding Zubac. We're going to get another slip. And again, KD's got to do a better job with active hands here. Again, when we talk about the, the the defense getting into rotation, if you make this pass difficult, this pass to the slipper, if you make it difficult, he might fumble it. It might be harder for him to make a play out of it. But if you just let him easily get a catch on the slip, same sort of hedge from Eubanks, if you let him easily get a catch, then you're compromised. He comes downhill. Grayson Allen is tagging off of Norman Powell here in the left corner. And Norman Powell just cuts along the baseline and gets an easy dunk. So as you can see, the main coverage issue that the Suns were dealing with at the beginning of the game was they were hedging and getting giving up easy slips on the back end. This is a great example of individual defense from Terrence Mann leading to defensive playmaking from Russ. So I cut this play with the transition sequence so that we can see Russ's dunk. But on this play, uh, Terrence Mann is doing what's called top locking. So Eubanks has the ball. Then Grayson Allen is setting a pin down on Devin Booker or on Terrence Mann to get help Dev Devin Booker get open. And then Devin Booker is going to come all the way around this dribble handoff from Eubanks. See how Terrence Mann has positioned himself between Booker and the screen? That's uh, called top locking. He's refusing the use of the screen. And Zubac is there to help on a backdoor cut because Drew Eubanks is a non-shooter. Now, Devin Booker does eventually get around him, but it's more difficult, right? He's been dealing with a physical, aggressive play from Terrence Mann. That is now going to cause Devin Booker to rush the sequence. Terrence Mann recovers, and now he's locking and trailing. He's right behind him, right? So... This is a pretty easy read for Devin Booker as he comes down here. Russell Westbrook is digging down with what's called nail help because he's coming down off the wing to the nail to help. If he just takes his time and makes this over-the-top kick to Bradley Beal, 
Now we're in rotation. We have a baked in driving lane rip through to the right that is almost certainly going to draw Paul George in help, which is going to generate a wide open three for Kevin Durant. But instead, and I, I attribute this to Terrence Mann, Devin Booker's rushing and he just throws a lazy swing pass that gets easily stolen and taken the other way for a dunk. That's an example of making an offensive player uncomfortable with physical ball pressure. So moving on to our next clip, we're going to get another example of extra efforts from the Clippers. First, as Grayson Allen is running out on this transition possession, Norman Powell is going to make an effort to, uh, to make Grayson Allen change his shot. That effort forces him to shoot a tougher up and under layup. But watch Terrence Mann bringing the physicality to the situation. Kevin Durant has inside position. All he has to do is squat down low in a box out and hold his ground, but he's too passive. Terrence Mann just goes right through him, shoves him, taps out the rebound. And again, you're going to be like, oh, it's an over-the-back foul. Not in the postseason, it's not. That shit's allowed all the time. Like I was talking about in our power ranking segment, these games, they get physical, they turn into rock fights. The Clippers are punching. What you're seeing right now is you are watching the Clippers punch the Suns in the mouth and them just sit there and take it. And, and, and that that's the reality of this type of physical type of game. The tap out goes to Paul George. Paul George just confidently walks into a pull-up three-point shot. Another hedge and recover sequence. Russell Westbrook on the ball. Bradley Beal defending him. We're going to get our ball screen. Uh, excuse me. It's going to be Paul George with Kevin Durant on him. We're going to get the ball screen with uh, Eubanks. Another hedge. On the hedge, Zubach is slipping. But he's a little bit uh, a late to get back, which brings Devin Booker into the lane here. So we get another one, another hedge. This time, Eubanks is a little further out. Zubac is going to slip into the middle of the lane. Because of this slip, so remember, when we typically are in a drop coverage, we're running what's called no roller behind, which means his job is to stay further back and keep Zubac in front so that Devin Booker can stay in a position to close out. But because he's hedging, the roller is getting behind. When the roller does get behind, you have to tag. When there's a tag, that's going to leave an open shooter on the weak side. Paul George makes or, uh, makes a really nice read here because Bradley Beal is helping down off the nail and leaving Russell Westbrook open. Russell Westbrook makes the extra pass to Terrence Mann in the corner and he knocks down the three. So once again, that's our third example here in the opening sequence in just two and a half minutes of basketball of that hedge and recover scheme burning Phoenix. Here's a great example of incredible individual defense by Terrence Mann on Devin Booker. Once again, physical from the start. Watch. Okay, Terrence Mann identifies this action is for him. We're going to get the exact same sequence we saw earlier. A pin down from Grayson Allen on to Terrence Mann and a dribble handoff from Eubanks kind of coming over to this side. This time, though, uh, we're not going to get nail help from Paul George. He's going to stay home on Bradley Beal. So as Bradley Beal comes through, or uh, as uh, Devin Booker fights over the top, look at Terrence Mann stay attached over the top of this screen. Look at this individual defense here. Chase, 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 slide back in front. He gets back in front and gets a great contest on Devin Booker. That's outstanding individual defense by Terrence Mann. And again, like to be clear, we know Devin Booker can handle that type of defense. We know Devin Booker can make that shot. But this is how you help lead a player into the lesser efficient outcomes. These, this is how you control your destiny and make it more likely that he's having an off night. Here's a possession from er earlier in the game with a similar back pressure uh, applied by Russell Westbrook. Ball screen, Bradley Beal is going downhill. He's got a head of steam. Russ just gets over the top. He has one job. Make Bradley Beal think about him coming there. Over the top gets a good final contest. That's how you prevent an offensive player from getting comfortable. Here's an example of how switching can stagnate a defense or stagnate an offense. So again, we have Russell Westbrook on Kevin Durant. We have uh, Norman Powell on uh, on uh, Grayson Allen. Now it's a switch. Now Norman Powell is on KD and Russell Westbrook is on Grayson Allen. So whatever little action they were running, that action is now over. Now uh, Eubanks is going to set a pin down on Norman Powell. Problem is they don't want Zubach to switch onto KD. So this is kind of like just an example of a, uh, of a smart pre-switch. Instead, they just have Russell Westbrook switch back out onto KD so that 
Norman Powell can switch back out onto Grayson Allen and uh, Zubach can stay on, stay on Eubanks. So smart little switching scheme to shut down that action. Now KD comes up to set the ball screen. Russ and Paul George just switch. And so all of that action that they just ran accomplished absolutely nothing. Now Russell Westbrook, a very good perimeter defender, is on Bradley Beal. Bradley Beal doesn't really know what to do. There's only 10 seconds on the shot clock. He just throws this super lazy swing pass to Grayson Allen that gets a turnover. That's a turnover caused by stagnation, stagnation caused by switching. Just a ridiculous piece of shot making by Paul George over Kevin Durant in the corner. A little step back. Unbelievable piece of shot making. This is a really high IQ example of defensive playmaking by Russell Westbrook. The Suns are going to set up for what's called stack pick and roll. So Kevin Dur or, uh, excuse me, Bradley Beal has the ball. Drew Eubanks is going to set the ball screen on Terrence Mann. Zubach is in a drop coverage. Now, we know we've covered stack pick and roll on this show before. Bradley Beal has one job here. He needs to set a back screen on Ivica Zubac, okay? And the reason why he's setting that back screen on Avicii Zubac is to basically open up this role for Eubanks coming over the top. Because if, if Zubac gets back screened and Russell Westbrook follows Bradley Beal, Eubanks is going to slip wide open on that backside. Russell Westbrook he, uh, knows it's coming. You can't hear it because I have the sound turned off, but you actually hear of Russell Westbrook screaming out the coverage as this is happening. And he, I, he, you can actually see his mouth open as he's yelling. But as he's yelling... Bradley Beal comes to set the back screen on Zubac. Russell Westbrook knows the play. He knows this is the read. This is a back screen. This guy's the read. Russell Westbrook is going to peel off of Bradley Beal and jump into that passing lane and get a steal. So again, that's 100% scouting and understanding the set that the offense is running. That is a high IQ defensive play made by Russell Westbrook to get a dunk out the other way. All righty. This is just a bad possession of off-ball defense from Devin Booker. We're going to get a run-through from Paul George here. Kevin Durant appears to be trailing. Devin Booker takes a step up like he's going to switch, but I don't know why, Like, because Kevin Durant's going through. So this is poor communication here. And again, like the Suns, I've shown examples. We went over it on film last week. They can communicate. I've seen Devin Booker be the leader of that communication. This is just poor effort. They're not talking. As a result, Terrence Mann slips back door, and Russell Westbrook hits him with the dunk. Here's an example of that physical punching in the mouth that I was talking about. How about just a transition kick ahead to Terrence Mann? Watch Terrence Mann just bully Kevin Durant into his chest and get all the way to the rim. That's bringing the fight. Here's an example of the difference in physical advantages. Kevin Durant, huge height advantage over Terrence Mann. He's going to get a tough turnaround jump shot that was well contested that turns into a miss. Now, we're going to look at another matchup. This guy right here, Avicii Zubac, way bigger than this guy right here, Bull Bull. Why make the game more difficult than it needs to be? Ball gets thrown to Russ. Watch Russ immediately identify it. Russ catches, he looks, he sees. Zubac has a deep seal on Bull Bull. He's just going to back him down further into the lane, and we're going to get a really nice post-entry feed from Russ for an and-one dunk. So again, physical advantage on one end, tough pull-up jump shot. Physical advantage on the other end, bury him under the rim and dunk it in his face. That's a huge difference in the physical imposition of the game. Like I talked about in our uh, in our uh, uh, contender ranking segment, basketball is beautiful until it's not. And that turnaround jumper looks real damn pretty when it goes in. But you know what goes in every single time? The bigger dude just dunking on the smaller dude. There's no, it's not as pretty in terms of shot making, but it's way more effective. All righty, this... Um, this next one is a defensive play by Terrence Mann that's going to lead to another transition run out. So first of all, right here, Terrence, uh, Amir Coffey's chasing Devin Booker. And because he's chasing him with real length and athleticism, Devin Booker is going to be like, I need to go to the opposite side of the rim. This is a, a textbook example of an offensive player using the rim as an extra piece of uh, of uh, almost like a screen. So he doesn't he he knows that Amir Coffey's best chance to block him is on this left side of the basket. So he's going to come around to the right side of the basket, and Terrence Mann is going to meet him there and force him to kind of go up and under, and he's going to smoke the layup. Then uh, running out the other end, we're going to get the exact same kind of sequence. This time, Zubac is ahead of Bull Bull. So in the transition defense, someone else is going to pick him up. This time, it's Grayson Allen. Hands up already. Paul George identifies it, throws it to Zubac, buries him, and dunks it.
Here we're going to get another really nice piece of shot making from Paul George hitting a uh, a nice little dribble pull up over Bradley Beal on the right elbow area. See, they can do the pretty shit too, but they can do the pretty shit, but they can also kick your ass. This is some outstanding individual defense by Amir Coffey on Kevin Durant. So look, he's getting set up for the screening action. He knows Zubac is not switching, so he's got to stay attached. He does. The action gets him a little bit of an advantage here. Nice little tag from Paul George, by the way, to stop Kevin Durant from just immediately turning the corner. Turns into an ISO. Look at this. Physical, in his face, both hands on his body. Gets the hands off so he doesn't get the call. He knows the rip-through is coming, so he's got to take his hands off. Hands off. Look at that. That's such a smart defense there. Physical, but as soon as he sees the rip-through coming, hands off to prevent the foul. Look at that. Gets his hands away just in time. Slides his feet to the right. Gets an outstanding contest on the uh, on literally the guy with the highest release point in the league. Forces an air ball. Think about how often Kevin Durant works on that shot and how difficult it is to force him into an air ball. Excellent individual defense by Amir Coffey. And then here we go. Last last possession of this sequence. We're 32-4 to four at this point. We're going to get what's called a soft switch. So Paul George, again, outstanding pull-up shooter. The Suns want to switch this action because Thad Young, as a forward, is capable of switching. Royce O'Neal is going uh, to call for the switch on the screen. But this is a passive switch because he's back. An aggressive switch, Thad Young would have met him right here. But he's in a passive switch. You can literally see his weight on his heels. And Paul George just rises right over the top of him and knocks it down. So that's a, a great example, uh, uh, a little a little example from film of how the Clippers are capable of playing a very physically imposing brand of basketball and how Phoenix, if you punch them in the mouth, they have a tendency to kind of stagger and lose their confidence and fall apart in that sort of setting. We also know they can thrive in that setting, but they're very inconsistent in that type of setting. Like I talked about earlier, it doesn't come naturally to them the way it does for the Clippers. And it, it, to me, it gives the Clippers a little bit more resiliency in the way that their game translates to the postseason. And that is, in my opinion, a good breakdown of, uh, or a good example of why I have the Clippers one step ahead of the Suns in my contender rankings. All right, guys, that is all I have for today. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. We'll be back tomorrow with a uh, uh, game breakdown of Denver, Minnesota, as well as the 3 2 1 in our contender rankings and a mailbag. And then we have the Nerd Sesh guys coming on on Friday, which should be fun. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow.